Right, thank you for coming tonight. Um, tonight we've just got a couple of sessions. So Manip's going to talk to us about Diamond 365 for retail. Karthik's going to be giving us a, a one tip. And uh, then I'm going to take us through our field service update from Business App Summit uh, last month. So a bit of uh, some of the recent features that come out, um, show them off a little bit, and then um, some of the, the roadmap where Microsoft is investing their focus at the moment. Um, so from a, a notice board uh, perspective, just one of the things I wanted to call out for anyone who's not aware is of um, Summit next month that's happening in Melbourne. This is an event that's uh, usually run in the US and India. Um, in the US, I get on around 6,000 people attending this. It is uh, driven by the user group communities and it's uh, presented at by MVPs, by users, by uh, Microsoft staff as well. The, the content is very much driven around what people are actually experiencing. Um, what they want to show you, the things they've implemented, and the, the new technologies. So unlike a, a Microsoft conference where it's going to be focused on where they're heading and only the new stuff, this will actually touch uh, a lot of that other stuff that you may not have had a chance to look at and feel with as well. So uh, if not too late, um, towards the end of August next month, I would recommend going as first time has made it down under to Australia. Uh, we do also have, I have got the, the link up at the moment, but the Dynamics 365 Saturday next month happening in Perth. Um, although it's been rebranded this year to Dynamics Power and is on a, a Friday afternoon, a Friday in the uh, Microsoft office. So if you have a search for Dynamics 365 Saturday Australia, you'll be able to see um, what day that's on. And that's a, a free event for you to come along to as well. And then, cheers, <coughs> Uh, today's topic, uh, oh, my name's Manip, by the way, uh, and today's topic is going to be about retail, uh, Dynamics for retail, so if you're curious about what it is, uh, what's in it, uh, it's a different application, all that stuff, how to get started, uh, this is the demo for you, so I'll go through that. So running your first pause, uh, that's one part of retail, so there is the head office as well. Uh, there is a concept called modern pause, cloud pause. So one is fully browser based, one is client based, so, and I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, talk about the back office and the features in back office, and wrap it up quickly around <coughs> e-commerce and what's in standard e-commerce and get it out of the box. So I don't have too many slides, it's mostly demos, so if you want to ask questions, go for it. <laughs> so the <coughs> first thing that you go, first place to go to is LCS or Lifecycle Services. So in terms of the finance and operations world, or the dynamics finance and operations and retail, uh, the, back, the back end is essentially DevOps or finance and operations. And your first landing page is LCS to manage all your environments, your production, your tests, your dev, boxes, uh, all the business process, everything is via LCS tool. So this is the environment page. I've got my one of my dev boxes showing up in here. Uh, the first thing that you'll see if you want to access the retail components is under the login, you'll see a bunch of uh, links here or log into environment. That takes you to the head office or the back office. So that is the FinOS uh, workspace that you see here. The next one down is your cloud pods. So if you want to experiment with pods and kind of get a feel of 
what cars is about. That's just one part of the retail. You don't have to use just the cost components. You'll, you'll get into this screen. It'll ask you for your operator ID and password. Uh, if you're using Concoso or Demo, uh, I usually use the 000160. If you search for that and go to the Dynamics box page, there is a guide to talk through how to actually set that user up. You can access it. Default password is 123. So first time use, it'll go through some walkthroughs, some videos as well. I'll just close out of those. <coughs> but that's pretty much your POS launch, or cloud POS, I should say. So this works both on your mobile, your browser. Uh, so it is, it will render nicely, it will shrink down, it will expand out. So if I collapse this, You'll see the tiles kind of squeeze in at the bottom. Some of the main features, you've got your search bar at the top. So the search bar works for both of the products and customers. So if I type in, let's say, my favourite customer, Karen, she's got some nice information on, on her. So this is the customer's card. So you'll see some great information here, like the loyalty card. Uh, the beautiful thing about uh, retail is the whole Omnichannel experience. <coughs> uh, here Mark's talking about Omnichannel. It's about the POS, it's about the head office, it's about the e-commerce, it's about the integration and the SDK that you can use. Through all those, you'll get the same, uh, I should say, very similar development experience in terms of building the business logic. So the great thing is uh, loyalty is one of the great features in uh, POS, or I shouldn't say POS, in the retail as a whole. Uh, you can do tiered loyalty structure. We've got some recent purchases here. We've got the wish list. Wish lists are really your baskets in your e-commerce site. So if you've added a few products into your wish list in your e-commerce page, it actually shows up here. Somebody can actually put an order in online, come walk into store, uh, hey, I'll put this thing in my basket. Okay, what's a user? Search for the user and have them pick up your order straight from the store. Some recommendations of uh, similar products that you've bought before. So this lady, Karen, is interested in baseball. So baseball gear. Uh, recent orders. Okay. Attributes, which are user-defined fields, so you can set that up with the head office, push it down, and they can capture extra information like, hey, uh, you know, what's your hobby, what's your postcode, you know? So those kind of uh, information. Uh, products. You can go to products in a number of ways. One is through the tiles here. All this is customizable, the tiles and drill down the categories and go through that way. And this is a product that's got a variant, so plus 12. Add to the cart, you'll see the cart numbers going up over there on the left-hand side. Another way you can do it is by categories in here. Another way you can do it is by searching for it. Another way you can do the same thing, multi-select. It's all touch screen enabled. So getting to the cart, number of operations that you can do here. So we're, all, we're happy with the leather, whatever the photo is, and a strip dress. <laughs> so we'll just pay that. Say that's a straight cash payment. There we go, no change. Another way you can do it is with the barcode scan Scan it, the dip. There you go. Use accessories. 
Kayak itu lah. Okay. So that's essentially cloud pause in a quick nutshell, but that's just the, you know, touching the small bit of features. Now, modern pause. It's a desktop install application. Guess what? It's pretty much the same thing, except it's installed. The advantage of modern pause is it can go offline. So if you've got a store uh, that is low connectivity, it will go straight to modern pause. If you want to integrate into hardware that is at the local store, you go to modern pause. You can still go with the cloud pause. It's got a hardware uh, hardware connector or uh, that you can talk to, but it's not a direct link. So, but it still works the same way. So, if you've got a store like a fairly large store. Most likely have modern pause installed. If you've got staff walking around, you probably have cloud pause on their mobile around their mobile device. Uh, in terms of development experience, it's pretty much the same thing. If you develop it for one, you have, you have to consider the other as well. It's one solution that you develop, once you publish it, you can direct it. It's backward compatible as well. So if Microsoft releases a fix, or releases a new version, it's always backward compatible. So you don't have to upgrade uh, straight away. You can sort of hold off and say, let's say you've got 500 stores in Australia or throughout the world. You can roll it out in stages. It's always backward compatible to the adults. Another feature of retail is the head office component. So in head office, there is a concept called call center or used to be called call center, now called customer service. So you can actually, you know, if you're working in a call center and you're getting orders uh, through the phone, you can actually put order in here and have it picked up at the store. So I'll go through that scenario for you now. So I'll search for, so I've launched the customer order screen. So I'll search for Karen. Okay, here are her previous orders. So retail has been advertised a lot as a, a standalone product. Do I need FinOps to have retail? Uh, in terms of the back office, yes, you can deploy retail without the other extra stuff. But if I had to get technical, it's pretty much FinOps in the back end. So uh, it's just the extra module of retail, which enables a whole bunch of later features. That's pretty much it. You can embed retail within Dynamics customer engagement. So we've got some customers where they have walk-in branches, but also staff in a call center. And if they want a richer um, experience around selecting products and cross-sell and upsell and all that, then you can just embed the uh, the retail within a frame within customer engagement to, to do that. Create a new order, add the item here. Ten of those. Okay. You can one other feature around retail is also the payment processing. So they <coughs> can get a little bit complicated. Uh, now that I've been in the payment processing for about a year, with the whole concept of uh, fully connected or semi-connected or uh, card not present scenarios. So card not present, and if somebody calls in, gives you their number. Uh, 
takes the order, authorizes the payment, but doesn't actually duck the money. Okay. Once the invoice has been posted out, that's when it takes the money out. All that stuff that's handled through retail. And that works uh, via the head office, which you see here. Works on POS, also works on the e commerce. <coughs> So let's just say Karen didn't want to finish her order and said, hey, uh, I'll go actually pick it up in the Houston store, please. So I'll go to the Houston store. It's Pulse here. So what I can do here now, or what I'm trying to demonstrate, is I'll search for the customer's order, and then what I'll do is I'll pay it at the store. Some of the cool stuff that you can do with the searching, you can search by the customer, customer name. Hopefully you have it screen now. No, I don't think so. It doesn't work up to you, the next button. <laughs> But essentially, it will bring it into the cart, and from the cart, it will ask for a payment type. I can process that with a credit card, 50 cents, and pay it straight then and there. Uh, I can also, the other things that you can do also is that you can actually ship from your point of sale. So you can actually put the order through at the point of sale, send it off to the head office, the head office will get it straight away, and they will do the shipping and bring it to your home. Or, you can select a different store as well. Another cool feature around this is the inventory lookups. Getting close to time. So searching for the youth combo set or bike set that I've got there, you can see the inventory availabilities at each store. You can drill down to the availabilities as well. Actually, see it by date. So they don't have uh, an order coming up that you won't be able to sell this. Now, let's get into. Now, I'll talk about some of the customizations <coughs> and stuff that you can actually do around the head office and personalize some of these POS terminals uh, or stores. Workers. So I'll go from the worker and I'll show you the screen that he's got customized. So I'm logging into Alexander. Zero point sixty under the retail tab. You'll see a screen layout that he has. So you can allocate the screen layout at this level and you can also allocate it at the store level as well. There's some store permissions as well. Can they close the register? Can they open the register? Can they uh, 
to re refund uh, all those permissions or control down that's going to be pushed out to source. Uh, so you can see in one of the F3 manager screen layouts, so that's the one of the full screen or fabricator managers. There's a designer here. Uh, I have to use Chrome. I have to use IE for this, by the way. You can't use Chrome because of Click Once application. Downloads. But what we'll do is we'll launch uh, an editor, which you can drag in the buttons, so move the buttons around, uh, kind of play around with some of the rules hide things, add new operations, and so on. Now, the other thing that I want to do is show you, show you the registers. So I'm logged in at Houston. This is one of the registers that I've got set up. You can hook that up. You can hook that register to a device. The device can be, if I drill up to the device, it can be a modern POS or it can be a cloud POS device, which you can see down here. Okay. If it is a modern POS, you can download it from here, install it. You can have your IT master POS. Okay. The other thing you'll notice is the store number, so you can what you can group the registers by store. So when you do your deployments, you can just deploy by store. There's also hardware profile. So depending on the store, uh, you've got an option of defining hardware profiles like does this register have a, a, a barcode? Uh, does it have a, a printer? Uh, does it have a finger scanner or something like that? You can add your own. You can extend it out uh, to the way you want. Now, that is pretty much what I want to show you. This slide. Last piece that I want to show you is. E-commerce. So, e-commerce isn't something that you deploy straight away to production. It is really essentially a code example because when it comes to e-commerce, it's really people are using best of breed out there. You know, the machines are high these best of breed e-commerce solutions, and a lot of times customers already have an e-commerce site that they already invested heavily in and that they want to integrate. What this is doing is essentially showing you the potential that you can do work with the back office. How to do the integrations, how to do the products, how to do the pricing, how to do the inventory levels, how to do the fulfillment, how to do the payments, how to do the complex part of the bank. Okay. So I can do the exact same thing by putting an order through here and Picking it up at the store, picking it up at the head office, or shipping it out. Same concept with cards. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I won't take you through the whole thing because I haven't configured the login stuff. All that stuff is available and stable. Uh, if you make some control. Can you check out as it gets? I can, but again, I haven't configured the payments. Okay. It will ask me for the credit card, and it will error out uh, when I actually place the credit card payment. Does it support other transactional accounts like PayPal or? It's like that, or is it strictly just the framework? framework is there. So what standard out of the box Microsoft supports is uh, Adian, which is one of the more popular payment uh, 
vocal writers out of the box. So anything out of that, yeah, it's not the same. But the framework is there. The framework is essentially a whole bunch of methods for code versus how you do this thing, how you do uh, organized and payment. And not every payment provider is the same. And unpayment providers uh, work, like let's say for recently I was working with uh, two payment providers where one did the connection in the hardware. So in the hardware, they actually had the software installed. And that actually went to the uh, gateway. So it was fully, I should say that, semi, semi connected. The other scenario, scenario was fully connected where they had the hardware was pretty much a dummy. All it did is capture the credit card and didn't actually send it on. It actually just sent you a token. And then you had to do the sending on to uh, the payment. So again, Every credit card provider is different. That's why it's, it's actually Marshall studies to find out the framework and supports one that they've done for end to end, which has been a pain in the last 10 years. There's, there's quite a lot of work going on around the e commerce space. I don't know the details yet, but watch this space. <laughs> you don't tell anything, do you? <coughs> That's pretty much. Thank you. Any questions or? I mean, what about the, how does these uh, updates come? Is it same as normal FinOps or is it from uh, the LCS perspective? It's pretty much the same thing. All that the upgrade will do is basically spit out uh, the new version of it. And then you have to do the So again, all that merging is done through into the DevOps. So if you've done the branching and all that stuff properly, it should be relatively easy. And because it's all extensions based, it's really just a bunch of folks that you've got. But that's manual. And yeah. the reason is for back compatibility. So essentially what is true for FinOps in terms of assemblies replaces assembly and you deploy a solution and you don't have any trouble, that's not the case. You still have to go and do that manual merging. Of the if port. you've done customizations. If you haven't done customizations, it's all most likely you've done a few customizations and some manual versions, and it's up to you to say that this store will take the new version. And the store will not get it, unless it's a uh, uh, cloud policy. The cloud policy always the latest version. Thank you very much. Uh, it's pretty configurable. That's probably one of the more powerful side of things. So the, the, the retail categories that you can set up, uh, uh, you can hook into a lot of the uh, SDKs to be able to do the recommendations and things like that. But out of the box, it's really just a straight. Uh, you like bought this product. You say the category recommend this one. Yeah. That's essentially what you, you saw there. Yeah. 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 Default, but it has the category. Yeah. All that stuff is already there. All the events and everything like that. It's very interesting. Thanks. There's a lot of um, AI capabilities being built in as well, so the system will start to learn spine patterns and behaviors and profiles. So I think it's what is the embedded intelligence feel in the LCS. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the unseen is just on or off, but unseen to the point where Mm -hmm. So next, uh, Kathy's going to give our one tip for this week. All right, finish the display next slide. Um, yeah, so basically I've been doing this weekend, and I've noticed that um, Microsoft actually brought back the mobile offline functionality. Um, I noticed in, the third, in version eight it was there, but suddenly when they transferred over using the new unified interface, it was completely gone, and a couple of clients were asking now what's going on. So just recently within a couple of weeks, um, yeah, they added that back in. Um, for those who don't know, the, mo mo the mobile offline functionality is just self expansion it's, it's for people who are using the uh, dynamic platform on their mobile 
where it was provides to just access to information. If if they do have a connectivity issues, what happens is that um, the information is stored on the phone or the tablet, and then as soon as they get back to the network, then it gets backed up to it. Um, so basically, it's you can use it on iOS and Android devices, and Microsoft still has support on Windows Phone apps for some reason. I guess Mac are easy now, so. Um, and uh, it offers the ability to, uh, it offers just a subset of anti use right now, which is a fair amount of out of box anti use opportunities, products, all, all the sales related ones as well. And you're able to basically do basic uh, sales pipeline related um, actions like covering opportunities as well. Um, you may or may not have noticed uh, in the new settings area, it's now you see a button called Mobile Offline. Initially in version 8, it was just a matter of going through the solution and choosing the entities that you want. Now you can go into the Mobile Offline um, area and where it will show a list of profiles. Um, these profiles basically dictate what's being shown in which app. So the idea around is that you create uh, an offline profile. Um, you put the entities that you want to show on that profile, and then you associate that profile to either specific users or also you can, now that Microsoft has added um, an additional section in the apps themselves to allocate the different profile that you want. So once that's done, you get, just need to publish it, and whoever's logging into the, the application, um, whichever app that they choose, they can show different information that needs to be um, think if they were to get disconnected. Uh, so I've added a new so the link there if anyone's interested just can go there and have a look. So. This is it. Cool. There's a lot of work being done on the mobile offline capability. So the way it was described to me is when you use Outlook, you don't think about going in online, offline, it just happens, and that's kind of ultimately the experience they want to get to with uh, Dynamics and the Power Platform. So that's, I don't know when they'll get to that, but that's what they're trying to get to. Just before I jump into the field of service, just a little quick uh, tip, a little bit of uh, news that's coming out. Um, don't press your partners too hard about this one because we're all just starting to learn about it now, but there is a change coming to the, the licensing structure in October. Um, so more of a focus around you start to buy a base license, which entitles you to say maybe it's a sale base license, and then instead of having to pay for like an entire field service as an add-on, you only pay for the little add-ons after that. Um, going okay, but now I'll buy myself a plan. So the plan themselves are going to go away in favour of this idea of your base plus your add-ons. Um, you will see more information coming. Um, your partners hopefully have just heard about it, so they might be able to tell you a little bit more of knowledge now. Yeah. I'll just say, add something to that. So, so when they did the analysis, um, most users only ever use one app. So they were paying for a plan license but only using one app within that. So the way that the new pricing will work is for customers that are just using one app, they will get a reduction in license cost. Um, if you looked at customers that were using, or users that were using two apps, that made up um, a lot of the rest. Um, and so the cost of the base license plus additional app was the same as the current plan license. So the number of customers that had users that had three or using three or four apps was minuscule. So for the majority of customers, it won't mean a, uh, an increase in price. And in fact, for a lot, it may even mean a reduction in price. And uh, probably a, a key thing about it is it's, it's not that it applies to you on the 1st of October, it applies on your renewal date. So if you're under an EA, CSP arrangement, it's not until whatever that anniversary date is that the new license will come into um, So I've uh, stolen some slides from um, Ben Bonner and Kyle, please don't tell them. Um, this is the, the deck that they presented at uh, Business Apps uh, Summit um, last month. Um, they set the expectation up front that this is about the why they're doing things the way they are and not the, the how, and that there was tons of sessions on the how. Um, Business App Summit, all these sessions, most of them were recorded, all the slide decks are actually 
available online. So if you're interested in seeing some of that content, um, please go have a look for VZAP Summit Atlanta. Um, there was a lot of good stuff that was presented there. One of the things I wanted to, to call out is in the field service space, there has been a lot of growth over a unlabeled chart. Um, so they were quite excited and wanted to thank everyone for being involved in that journey. Um, industry trends, I wanted to call out that um, typically businesses are starting a cost center sort of model. Like if you're doing field service, servicing, it's about how do I reduce the servicing I have to do because it's a cost to my business. That's the first level. Then moving on, we want to go to our profit center. How do we turn the servicing we do into something that we can make money off rather than just um, like see that as an opportunity to differentiate from our competitors and drive better margins on the service we provide. But the next level, which is starting to see a lot more businesses getting up to, is the serviceization. So it's a service-based business model rather where we deliver the outcomes rather than the products. So I'm not here to just repair your air conditioner when it breaks. I'm here to offer you a service around your um, air conditioners throughout your business and uh, upgrading them at the right time. That's sort of a different mindset away from the minimizing the pain. Um, so in that, the trends that they're seeing is people are focusing on the improving of utilization, contracts and consumption models, uh, customer expectations on businesses tooling for field service is rising a lot. Um, communication and updates is becoming critical. You can't just say, uh, you know what, uh, Telstra will send you a technician in a month. Um, products are becoming services. It's not just about having the air conditioner or say the projector in this room. It's about uh, renting a lot of these stuff and actually uh, borrowing it for a period of time and having a, that kind of thing that they can have on a tax claim as well. So different sort of model with the business and moving more to fixing things before they break. IoT becoming accessible, not too expensive to be able to start getting those readings and reacting to things a lot quicker. Um, what is mobility? So this is part of their, their trends and things that they're seeing as well is we've all seen over the last five, six years or so the, the Google Glass, the HoloLens, these, these different kind of technologies around smart glasses and contact lenses is something that people are working on. Um, we've seen the, the, the watches that have come out and the, the newer things we can do with them around the, the health monitoring side of things. Um, other sorts of uh, safety monitors and our devices around temperature sensors and the likes, smart clothing, language translator, um, haptic feedback technology. Now they're quite an exciting one. I've seen a, a Google video actually where they've created entire kind of outfits out of this fabric that is smart. You, you touch it in different spots and it responds. Um, for a, it wasn't, I don't think it was Google, it was another company. I saw a, a video where they created a outfit for someone that was one of these and then they sent her loose in a particular event to see how much um, harassment this lady would get. And it actually showed like every time she was touched, where she was touched and they could record like what's happening at this place and how appropriate it was in this situation. Uh, so a lot of haptic is quite interesting, some of the things coming out of that. And of course, we all know about um, drones and what's happening in that space and other aerial technologies, but tying more of that back into these sorts of services that we can offer. So what about enterprise asset management? Now, 18 months ago, you go to Microsoft and say, field service for enterprise asset management, they say, we're not trying to compete in that space. However, with the acquisition of the Dynaway product um, and the building of that into the FO platform, they're now saying, no, we are now ready to say we have this offering available. So between the asset management from Dynaway and FO and the field service, there is their complete enterprise asset management offering. Um, CMMS, similar sort of thing that they're saying, well, our product is now mature enough to actually compete against those products in the market. Um, Asset-based performance, so we'll see a lot of that on the asset management side field service that we know and love, um, transportation and logistics, and then the mobile workforce management. So I got off a call with um, the uh, Dan Gittler who manages the universal resource scheduling uh, the other week, and he was talking to me about how in the roadmap they want to build in uh, shifts and roster. Anyone who's used field service knows that the calendar of when people are available to work is pretty rudimentary at the moment, and if you've got a, a model where it's like two weeks on, one week off, it doesn't cope with but they're looking at what can they do to, to change that, shift that around, and make it easier for you. Maybe that'll involve the, the shifts tooling that's been available in Teams just recently. That's one way they could integrate that in. Um, the average first time fixed rate is just 
meaning more than a quarter of service calls require return visits. So this is a, a kind of a over the industry sort of number that they've come up with. I know a lot of uh, businesses where that number is a lot less than 74%. But if we can start tackling some of these common reasons of the wrong tool, the wrong time, they couldn't access the right information, we can reduce that. The cost of sending a person to a place to do a job and they don't have the right maturity and you've got to send another person, it adds up very quickly and it's a lot of money. Just think about an electrician call out there. I have to pay the 100 bucks and I can't do a thing and I've got to send another person out. It's another 100 bucks straight away. So they want to enable the customers to transform their field service offering, reduce the back office effort, reduce the mileage from people having to, to travel multiple times or doing overlapping routes, um, improve that first time fix rate, reduce the days, days sales outstanding. So basically engaging customers better and getting from the first point of contact to the resolution of the sale a lot quicker by having a fully integrated platform and then get a, getting that better analytics out of the AI that's available to us. So product trends. Um, Microsoft has seen that there are four kind of key uh, buckets of focus that um, have been going on. So technician productivity is, is a big one. How can we give them the right tool, make them productive and not make this form that we're giving them on a tablet slow and tedious for them because we don't want to slow them down. We want them actually hands on the tool to get the job done. Um, how can we schedule more resources and more effectively? So it can be much more effective in our scheduling, um, the impact of the Internet of Things, and then field service ultimately it is customer service. It's not uh, this behind the scenes thing that happen. When someone comes and does a maintenance or repair, it is about giving the right experience for the customer. So these are the four kind of buckets that Microsoft is focusing their attention on. So the what's new now to start off with you, we're actually going to talk about stuff that's been available since April. So there's a lot of this stuff that's come out and with the new release model, new features are not turned on by default. They're enabled in your environment when you update and then you go and say, yes, I actually want them turned on. So you're not getting uh, nasty surprises. So for example, multi-requirement scheduling, this is uh, quite a handy one. So if I take an example, let's say I wanted to, um, I'm managing buses. I've got a schedule that I need to get a bus. I need to get a driver and they need to be here at this time to do that particular journey. Uh, in previous versions, you could only really take that I would schedule one resource, whether it was the bus or the driver, and getting the two of them together at the same time was a bit of a problem. Now with multi-requirement scheduling, I can actually define one work order and on that job, say I need one resource that has this skill set, there's my bus, here's another requirement, which is my, my driver, different skill set required and it will only schedule where both of those are available at the same time. Um, Cruise. Cruise has been around for a little while, but it's also got a nice enhancement to it. One of the limitations was people were either part of the crew or they weren't. Now you can actually time base them and say, they're in the crew for next week, they're in the crew for the month. Um, facility scheduling, so the ability to say, okay, I run a workshop, I've got three bays. I want to manage them and actually manage uh, the work orders coming to me not me going to the work. So that's very much a, a different shift in the way that uh, field service worked in the past. Um, Capacity-based scheduling. Uh, in my particular workshop, my single bay, I can deal with up to three cars parked in there at one time, because perhaps it's quite a big space. So that <coughs> idea that I can actually have concurrency in my jobs, rather than only be able to have a person available to do one job at a time. Um, resource pools, I, I need an electrician. I assign the job to the pool of electricians, of which there are 20 of them, and I know that there is 18 that have availability. The next level of person can then actually go in and say, well, I'm going to get this particular person to take the job and do it. So for my scheduling now, I don't have to go straight to a man resource. I can go to a group of people who I know have availability. And then just some enhancements around the, the fulfillment preferences side of things as well. So this one is where, um, like think of your hairdresser, where they work in chunks of half an hour or an hour, you can go at 9, 9.30, 10 o'clock. Field service in the past would book you at 9.05. Now you can say your preferences are to expose those sorts of windows. It's a half an hour box, for example. Um, other ones that are out now is the, the quick scheduling. So whenever you went on a, on a work order or something you wanted to schedule and say, let's book that, you've got the whole big schedule board, you've got all the people, you've got all the times to, to select from. It could be a bit overwhelming for a person when it's customer service operator, all they want to do is say, 
I need someone. Oh, look, someone's available at that time. Go. Don't care who they are. Quick scheduling now gives us that ability that you can change an, an entity to focus on scheduling by just a list of times rather than focusing all the people in the schedule. Travel time updates. Now, this is, I think, quite an important one. Um, before, when you dragged and dropped a work order onto the schedule board, or you moved around the order in which people did jobs, travel time would not update. It would either not exist, or it would remain what it was when the job first got scheduled. By turning this particular feature off, every time you make a change to someone's schedule or put another job on there, it will recalculate the travel time for them to get to there. So that's a big and important improvement. A good one for people who are manually scheduling where in the past it wasn't showing them on the drag drop as uh, time as well. And the scheduling API, so, so this was put together uh, first of all for Dynamics Portals. So the idea that from Dynamics Portal we could make a query to the scheduling API and go, find me someone who can do this. And so now on the portal you can actually expose to your customers the ability for them to book their own appointments. Um, but being an API, it does mean that you don't need to use Power Portal or Dynamics Portal or whichever name it's today. Um, you can build your own system to, to do that level of integration. So this was just a slide that basically took a lot of those new features and broke them down into those four kind of buckets that Microsoft was talking about. Um, some of the new stuff that's come out, so push notifications down on the tablet device. It wasn't truly pushed before, now it's, it is. Um, 3D models is, is quite a cool one. You can actually upload the 3D model into the web and you can see it in there. And down on the field service tablet, it'll render it as a 2D rendition of that. So that's very handy. Um, Geofencing and background location. So the previous location tracking needed the app to be forefront in the actual device. If it went into the background, uh, the Android and the Apple would actually kill off the tracking. Now they've um, made the relevant changes to the app so we can support actually live tracking on where the device is. Um, remote Assist, so this has been getting developed a fair bit and I've got a short little demo if I've got time on that one, but it's now coming out available on mobile devices. In preview for Android at the moment, iOS yet to come. Um, we've talked about the multi-resource scheduling. There's also the concept of uh, multi-resource requirements, so it's a bit of both in there. Facilities, crews and pools. Um, single resource scheduling is a nice one. So on the, for those of you who know RSO, it was the module to basically say, I have people, I have requirements, take care of it for me, schedule it the best that, you, that I need it to be done, the optimizer. Um, but it would be that bulk one. Now if you have RSO, you can actually right click on just one resource and say, reschedule this person today, re-optimize their day. Um, and what if analysis? So the idea with RSO, and this is a big one, to be able to say, I want to know what would happen if I ran RSO on this data set here. There's an outcome, I don't have to accept it, I can reject it and run another model and decide when I have the right model for my day and accept that particular outcome. Um, IoT updates and the like, so IoT Central is the, the big push in the direction. So obviously it's a more end user citizen developer friendly than the IoT hub was. Um, for anyone who's played with an MX chip, that makes it quite a nice little easy tooling to, to get your head into the space and understand it as well. Um, so they've got IoT flow templates that they're building on and releasing, more IoT commands so you can push back to these devices, um, and correlating these IoT alerts with the work order lifecycle. So you can actually do automatic updates to your work order based on the feedback you're getting from the IoT device. So a very simple example of that would be if you're um, getting the GPS coordinates of your technician, they physically arrive on site, it automatically updates the work order in progress. That's the next step in the lifecycle. Um, and then the, the customer service side of it, so getting SLAs down onto the work orders, a concept of entitlement on the work order, not the same as um, case entitlements, so if you're interested, go and have a look at that one. And there's a big push around the FNO integration, especially because asset management's coming out. Um, one of the things to know in that space is, in public preview at the moment, is um, dual right, which is the ability that when you make uh, your change in FO or CE, it will appear in near real time on the other side. I'm sure we've got another session on that itself. So, uh, so they've just taken the same, reordered it now by basically the flow in the work order where they kind of see that uh, coming into effect. And then the last few of that slide. So the roadmap and investment areas. Um, web client end of life. Anyone who has not moved to UCI, come February next year, 
um, the web client is going to be no longer supported and updated for field service. So make that your date that you must be in production for an upgrade of your to, to the UCI client, which is your migration from version seven field service to version eight field service. Don't confuse that with the platform version one. Um, so that's yes. Uh, the last one there, the auto update. So Microsoft have told us that they were going to start rolling out the automatic update for field service and for project service. They said they would start rolling out in May. I haven't seen it as of yet, but it is coming out, and that ties into that whole uh, end of life of web clients in version seven. So it makes it a lot easier for people to, to have those latest updates and keep us with the latest patches. Um, key investment areas. So proactive uh, service delivery, technical success, or technician success, sorry. Um, service insights and actions and resource scheduling. So that's where they're, they're focusing their attention at the moment. With the, the April release, we had the things that I've talked about uh, already. And in the future release, they're working on the mixed reality guides for field service. Has anyone here seen um, guides for field service video? Peter, I'm glad. Um, <laughs> really quite interesting. So uh, anyone who's seen the HoloLens and might have even seen us demo it before, um, it was always a bit of a stretch to say, well, how is that actually going to get used in real life in, in the business? Yes, I have seen it. Okay. Um, guides is basically a, uh, I'll call it a training tool for, for the HoloLens. So when you, you put it on and you say, okay, I, I'm here to service an air conditioner, it's a Fujitsu model, I can actually load the guide for that. <coughs> and I give it a pointer to get its reference point in my world. And then from that point, it'll actually guide me and say, this is what you do, this is what you do next, here's a video, um, I'm going to draw an arrow where you're meant to pull something out, I'm going to show you a visualisation of what you can't see behind the wall in front of you so you can reach in and grab something. So it's quite powerful and quite lightweight in that regard to, to implement and deploy. So it's going to be quite applicable in the real world where you might not have gone for the, the HoloLens in the past, it's quite powerful. Um, more of a focus on the, the business analytics, Suggested actions based on IoT, um, technical inspections. So, uh, in a field service work order, you've got the concept of the products and the services, you've got the service tasks that you perform. But if you're doing a job, quite often you've got to fill out some forms. You've got to fill out a, an inspection form that says, This is the job that I've done. Now, um, Murata actually had a solution in this space, as does DHC, but now there's going to be one natively out of Dynamics basically allows you to drag and drop design your form that needs to be completed, have it on a work order, have someone out in the field complete it. So that could be your take five, that could be a job completion form. If you're maintaining a vehicle, it could be the, the Toyota checklist for the 160k service. Um, they're going to have a focus on time entries, not the project service time entries. Well, it's the same structure, but I don't have to put my time against a project, I can put my time against work orders. So there's a bit of um, on that. ERP integration log mentioned, and then working on obviously optimizing areas of the system as well. Um, they did do call out to say, please remember ideas.dynamics.com or community.dynamics or experience.dynamics. Uh, I think all the links take you to the same place. Um, get on the forums, get on the blogs, get involved and help them evolve the product. Now that there's been a lot of attention on getting to, to UCI and getting a lot of these product updates in, the, the team has more time to focus on what's coming through in these um, particular forums now. So get in there, make your recommendations, get them voted up, and you'll see some of those things and, and the product teams actually have a KPI on um, addressing user ideas. They have to do so many in a, in a month or year. So, um, yeah, they do get listened to. That's it on the, um, the slideware side of things. I'll jump into environment for two minutes. Um, so there is a big call out as well that they've hired a person whose job is dedicated to um, doc updates. So if you go and look at the field service um, docs, you'll see that they're a lot more enriched, there's a lot more information in there than there used to be. And um, please provide comments down the bottom because this person's KPI is based on getting those documents up to date with the best right information. So we are seeing a lot more coming in there now. But actually in GitHub, so you can actually do a pull request and update them yourself if you really want to. I don't know anybody that's done it, but so I know we all want to go home, so I won't take too much time up, but I wanted to show you. So for my environment here and work orders, I've actually enabled it for quick scheduling. 
So now when I hit the, the book button, I get this quick schedule on the right. It gives me the ability to pick a day I'm interested in, and then it will tell me that oh, there are people available. That's nice. So I can see that there's one person available at these different times. I can just pick one and go book. I don't know who it is. I don't care who it is. They've got the skills. Get the job done. The quick scheduling. Schedule. So I've got my, my pool resource here, and I can um, split that into to two views. So my normal schedule board up the top, and now I'm having a look at my pool here, and I can see all the various resources that are available in that particular pool. So that's where, if I got a particular job, on the schedule view, um, I can give it to the pool like I talked about earlier, and then the person who manages the pool has the ability to say, well, it's, it's Abraham, he's going to actually do that work, and so I can bring it down. And then on the travel time update side of things, With this particular job here, um, if I move it around, um, the, the travel time will automatically get updated on that to, to reflect the person who's now uh, got that. If I take it back up to this person, drag it on. Initially, it will come in. In the past, that would have had no travel time. Now I can see all the travel time I'm playing. I don't have enough data to make it really nice for you, but an idea if I added a few more emails to the update, you might have it. Finally, I just wanted to give you a bit of a feel for remote assist. So the, the remote assist app on my, my phone, I can go into a contact list. I've got somebody called specialist in there that I'll I looked up and I'm going to uh, launch a call with them. I'm going to hold my phone for me and point it around somewhere. Yeah. Ringing on that side. Cool, it's calling you. So I'll get to um, hold still somewhere, of course. And what I can do from here is I can say I want to actually annotate on this. So I want to um, point someone out. Um, perhaps I want to uh, circle something else. And um, when I stop editing on that, we can actually see that this, this is what Peter said. So as he moves left and right and looks around the room, when he comes back to there, my annotations are still there. Pretty much. So the, long, as long as you give it a little bit of time to actually map the room before you start drawing on it, it does a pretty good job of uh, yeah, keeping that there for you. So that's um, the new feature in Remote Assistant. The fact that I don't have to wear a hollow lens to, to have this now, um, is, is quite powerful for being able to get that person called in to provide that sort of support. Thank you.
<laughs> um, there is the ability to insert files as well. So if I wanted to send a specification document or a photo to Peter in the field, it can appear in his field of vision on the phone, this particular PDF or diagram that I want him to see. Um, when we end that particular call, what it's actually going to ask Peter to do is it goes, do you want to track this against the job that you're doing right now? So then any uh, notes that are taken, photos, etc., will actually get straight back up into your workflow inside dynamics. I don't want to take any more time, so I'm going to leave it there. Any questions? What's the storage application on um, So with the move to capacity-based storage that's uh, underway at the moment, um, a lot of the, the stuff that we just captured is going to go against the file-based storage, um, but it's just as you'd expect. So if the photo is three megs that we take, it's going to add three megs to the storage usage. That's where your, your attention policy becomes very important. I really need all the photos taken on a work for a year. Questions? All right. Thank you, everyone, for um, coming this month. Um, enjoy your month. We'll uh, see you next month.